It's finally here, the last part of the read-along. I am done with this book and I can put it in the trash. I am so, so happy. Hey guys, welcome back to the read-along for A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Maas. We'll make it through the last four chapters this time and then it is over. Thank goodness, it's finally over. I'll put a final review of the whole thing at the end of this video. But let's get to it. Chapter 43, it's time for the third challenge. And Farah gets put back into her old stinking torn tunic and gets walked into, I think it's just the throne room again. I think it's the throne room. While she's walking past, plenty of the high fey and fairies give her a gesture that she says is for the honored fallen. So A, everybody assumes she's gonna fail this one. I also have to assume that this gesture means the exact same thing between humans and fairies because I don't see how they would hang out at the same funeral ever. Like, if this was just a fairy thing, where the hell would Farah have seen it? She's never encountered a fairy in her life. And if those are two different species with different customs and whatnot, then I don't see why the gesture would be the exact same. But you know, that's just another question for the world building that I'll just have to accept will never get answered and doesn't make much sense. While walking up to Amaranta, Farah thinks about the whole situation and drops a line like, and if Ryzen and Tamlin were playing games to keep us alive. Well, Ryzen, yes, okay, but where the hell has Tamlin ever been playing any games in this? I don't know, I don't understand Farah's way of thinking at all, but, you know, probably better might just mean I'm not brain dead, so yeah, it's good, it's good. Farah gets to the throne and is asked whether she has any last words. And her last words are obviously directed at Tamlin, how much she loves him, how she would do anything for him, blah, blah, blah. And she gets zero reaction from him. I don't think he's even looking at her. Yeah, good way to end this, I guess. And then Amaranta taunts her about the riddle. It's like, well, it's time for the third challenge. And she still haven't figured out the riddle, even though the answer is so lovely. And she actually uses the word lovely. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is a risky taunt at best because, you know, Farah might not be totally daft sometimes. I don't know. I mean, we know she is, but why does Amaranta know? I don't know. But I feel like it was a daft move on her part because the answer is pretty much there. But Farah doesn't notice it anyway, so I don't know why I even question the intelligence of any character here. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The guards bring in three prisoners with sacks over their heads, so you can only tell it's two guys, one woman. And the challenge is that Farah has to stab them in the heart with a dagger made of ashwood. She gets three separate daggers, like one for each, so she always has to pick up the weapon again and know that she's killing an innocent person. And this brings me back to why was there not a single weapon made of ashwood in Tamlin's whole estate? If metal doesn't work on fairies at all, then what's the point of having metal weapons? They would only be useful against humans, and if you are not encountering humans, then why would you not have weapons that make sense to you? Amaranta taunts us some more and follows this up with like an amazing split in logic, or I don't even know how to describe this. But she calls her sister innocent, you know, she was murdered by this human being, but she was innocent. But from what I remember, she was a general in this army as well, or some high-ranking officer in this army and killed thousands of human beings, but she was innocent. But Farah, on the other hand, has such a bloodlust for fairies because of a long, long history of killing a single high fae. So Amaranta considers this a gift to Farah because she can enjoy herself stabbing people. It's like, wow, the logic here is amazing. But now that Farah has reached a point where she actually regrets that she killed Andras in the first place, she hesitates. But it's literally a choice between refuse and die or do it and kill innocent people. And she tries to convince herself that she can do this for Prithian, for Tamlin, and for all of the fairies of the Spring Court, and possibly lots of other fairies in the throne room as well. She hesitates, and then Rysand appears by the throne and tells her in her head, yeah, just do it, do it, it's fine. And she still struggles with it because the first guy, when the sack gets removed from his head, is actually pleading and looks fairly young. 
that Farah does it in the end and really struggles with it. Actually, this is the most insight we've ever gotten into her emotions, like the whole time that she struggles with, oh my god, I just killed an innocent person. This is pretty much all you get from her emotional range over these last four chapters. She gets to the second victim, hesitates quite a bit, struggles, but the second victim just prays to some god and is not pleading or anything, which kind of makes it worse for Farah. But she goes through with it. And then when she gets to the third victim, she considers whether she should just stab herself after she's done, after she freed all of those fairies, then she could just go down herself. And then she also asks herself why Amaranta is still amused. Sack number three gets removed and it's actually Tamlin and what was sitting on the throne or next to the throne was the Ator. So there we go, why she got a zero reaction for her last declaration of love. And now Farah turns her brain on in an impressive fashion, I have to admit. She remembers that Alice told her, yeah, you just need to listen. Technically, she has all of the info she needs to achieve what she has to achieve or what the Supreme Court wants her to achieve. So she thinks about all of the conversations she's listened in on while she was at Tamlin's place and concludes. I don't know how long she's been standing there actually because it's like a couple of weeks or months that she has to look back on and a lot of stuff remember she just stands there and contemplates this and then it comes to her. Oh yeah, they've referred to his heart of stone more than once. I'm sure he has a heart of stone so I can stab him and nothing bad will happen. The more logical part of this is, well, if Amaranta wants him for herself then she wouldn't let me kill him. That part makes a lot more sense to me than, oh, mate, I've heard his heart is of stone like twice. That was not a metaphor, they were serious. Um, yeah, okay, sure, you remember this now. You had like three months in the cell to think about what Alice told you. But now, standing in the throne room, that's, that's when it all comes to you. God. She stabs him and she is correct. He has a heart of stone. And all the dust is dent the dagger, really. Tamlin is still wounded and bleeding on the floor, but definitely not dead. The fairies erupt into cheering, it's like, oh yeah, she won, we are free, or like, he is free, or you know, this stuff is over, she won the bargain. Then Miranda's just like, yeah, well, I said I would free them, I didn't specify when, and neither did she, so you know, maybe I'll do it when she's dead, maybe not, we'll see. Well, people are pissed, but then again, I don't know why anybody is surprised if you don't specify these things in the bargain, then yeah, of course, this high fay is gonna screw you over, but... You know, I, I'm even more baffled that all of the other high fey and fairies in this court are now confused or surprised that Amaranta doesn't stick to the bargain the way they imagine. It's like, yeah, I, I saw this coming, but okay. Now, more importantly, for the overarching story and does it make any sense, this means that instead of having Farah break the curse as it was originally intended by falling in love and actually telling him so in the set time. They went over that time, so that curse was technically over, I still don't know what that actually means because it seemed to have no real effect. But it means that all this time Tamlin foresaw that they might end up under the mountain, that Farah would come for him, that Farah would survive the first two challenges and then that this would happen? That makes no sense whatsoever. He couldn't know that Farah would actually travel all this way to get him. I mean, if she didn't manage to tell him that she loved him in the first few months after she already felt that way, you then expect her to travel back into fairy country and fight to the death for you? Like, yeah, super logical, sure. Part of this is also, Farah could overhear all of those conversations because Tamlin made sure like to leave the door open, to speak loudly enough, to leave her in a spot where he can lead the Ator so she can then overhear the conversation. So part of the curse was that you cannot tell this person what is happening with the curse. But how is having this conversation when you know full well that the person is listening? How is that any different than just having her sit at the dinner table while you discuss the curse with Lucian? As long as she's not part of the conversation, the curse doesn't apply apparently, so why bother? I mean, you could just sit her down and talk to Lucian like she wasn't there and it would be pretty much the same. 
I guess Amaranta didn't specify her curse well enough that, yeah, you know, you can't just go around by talking to somebody else and have them over here because that just seems like cheating. Well, either the curse is shit or they are cheating or, you know, or it just doesn't make much sense. Chapter 44, Temlin is bleeding on the floor, Amaranta gets miffed and starts torturing Farah. She is really annoyed that Farah won't admit to not really loving Tamlin because, wow, that's so important, but you know, whatever, that's Amaranta's deal, I guess. So while Amaranta attacks Farah, Rysand decides it's time for some action and grabs himself a dagger and attacks Amaranta as well. Just before when Farah's on the floor, she thinks she hears Rysand call her name and it's like, it sounds like he actually cares and I'm just like, you know your love interest is right next to you bleeding on the floor, right? Can we maybe stop focusing on this jackass over there? But no, we have to make way for the second book somehow, I guess. I don't know. It, just, it annoys the crap out of me. Unsurprisingly, he is not very useful against Amaranta. He just gets smashed into the wall a couple of times because I guess despite him having the most magic of all the high fae in the court, he is still no match for Amaranta. And Amaranta's actually pissed at him that he betrayed her and she gets really mad. I'm like, you didn't see this coming. Like, how did you not see this coming over the past three months? Oh my god. How did she last on the throne for so long? So while both Farah and Ryzen get kind of trashed by Amaranta, they have a moment where their bond is stronger than usual and Farah pleads with Amaranta to stop, not on, not for herself, but for Ryzen, and I'm just over here like... This makes me want to puke. But it's okay, a second later she remembers that she actually loves Tamlin and he's on the floor next to her. Cool, at least she remembers he exists from time to time. Amaranta is still going on about how she wants Farah to admit that she doesn't actually love Tamlin. And while Farah's on the verge of dying, she finally figures out the riddle. I guess Farah's brain only works properly on, like, in high-pressure situations or when she's about to die, I don't know. Chapter 45. Farah solved the riddle, so Tamlin's power is back to normal, the spring court loses their masks. But because Farah's on the verge of dying, she somehow gets transported into Rysand instead. She sees everything through his eyes now. But she can't actually do anything, so Ryzen is in control, I think. He doesn't do much here, so, but I think he's in complete control. Tamlin turns into his beast form and attacks Amaranta straight away. Lucian throws him a steel sword. It's specifically said that it's a steel sword. And Tamlin stabs Amaranta through the head and then tears her throat out. Why the hell is there a steel sword? What's the point? We've established time and again that it doesn't work on fairies and they are like Ashwood daggers right around you. Plus I think because Tamlin went out and killed other fairies with his bare hands before that his claws work just fine. So I, why does it make so little sense? It hurts my brain. Amaranta is dead. Some of the fairies flee, including the Ator. I guess, you know, if you're crony of the queen bitch, then you might want to run now and that's what they do. Tamlin leans over the by then dead Farah. She looks pretty dead at least. And starts crying and the other high lords come up to him and give him like a spark or something. And the last high lord to turn up there is Rysand and he tells him well we're even now because they are bestowing something on her that her that their predecessors granted very few. So I guess they're bringing her back to life. Well, they're turning her high fame, really, but yeah, all of the High Lords have to chip in for that, I guess. And Farah watches this whole thing through Ryson's eyes still. And I would still like to point out that Tamlin could have just done all of this the second Farah was given the riddle. We didn't need those three months under the mountain. When Ryson drops, this makes us even. Farah also says that she feels a twinkle of his humor. What humor? We've seen snide remarks from him. He's been an ass plenty of times, but when the hell has he ever been funny or shown any humor? I don't know what the hell she's on, but it's not in the book. Chapter 46. It's the last chapter, thank goodness. 
So Farah comes back to life as a high fae, is confused about how her body feels now because it's so much stronger. It seems to have sort of glow and her fingers are longer now for some reason, or at least they appear longer to her. I don't know. I doubt they just extended her fingers and changed nothing else, but whatever. But every second thought she has is for the two innocent fairies she killed. Nobody else speaks about them or mentions them in any way when things keep going, but she thinks about them constantly. The thing that really confused me, she keeps alternating between calling those two high fae or fairy. But I thought there was a difference between them. Like the ones that look less humanoid are the lesser fairies, and then the ones that look pretty much humanoid apart from the ears are the high fae. I guess it's just another question for the world building. Or maybe, just maybe, the author doesn't know herself either. Tamlin has plenty of meetings that day, like hasty talks between allied high lords and, you know, making sure the country is still running or something. I would assume that it was working okay-ish before, so this doesn't have to happen in the same day, but whatever. Farah gets really tired because, I guess, sensory overload, because everything is so much louder and brighter now that she has high fey hearing and seeing, I suppose. But they go back to their room. Tamlin wants to talk about something. She's like, no, no, I just want to make out. I don't want to talk about anything. It's fine. But then I think she is still wearing her stinking tunic. I mean, her body might have been redone, but did this include a wash? Because before she was just hanging out in her cell, so... I don't know, I can't imagine anything less sexy than the way she might smell at that point. But anyway, they make out. Farrah wakes up at some point to a tugging on the bond that she has with Ryzen. So she heads out to say goodbye to him. We learn some highly important things, such as he really likes flying and he's probably just as pale because Amaranta kept him under the mountain. But whatever, they have a bit of a conversation, it doesn't really matter. And then he tries to fade into the shadows because he needs to leave and apparently fading into the shadows is quicker than flying. I don't know how traveling really works for him. But then just before he stumbles, looks shocked at Farah and then just vanishes into thin air. And then we just move on. I don't know what the hell this means or why it was shown to us, if it has no meaning in this book. The first chapter of the next book is at the end of this book and this doesn't get mentioned there either, so I don't know, maybe it's just something that gets dragged through the whole second book again and we can just guess until then. My first thought was because he turns into the North interest in the next book and Haifei can mate for life or like they can find their soulmate, whatever. I feel like that's the first hint we get for that. Or something fishy is going on because Juvian's eye and finger bone are missing too. Who knows? And honestly, I don't care beyond today, so... Farah has some deep thoughts about love, including, well, rejection can really turn you into a proper bitch. Well, okay, she did paraphrasing it quite widely, but suddenly she thinks she has some understanding for Amaranta. And I'm like, yeah, what? Like three chapters ago, you wanted to skin her alive. And now you're like, yeah, I kind of understand where she was coming from. Like, uh, no, sorry. But she nailed a person to the wall and kept the corpse around for decoration. You don't need to feel sorry for this person. You really don't. Farah returns home with Tamlin. But her thoughts are still mostly on, oh my God, I killed innocent people. I mean, I understand why she can't enjoy this moment properly because she just murdered two innocent people, right? But I still think there should have been a bit more joy in this whole thing. It's like, yeah, it's over. The country is free. I'm back with the guy I was ready to do anything for. But no, she's just still upset and doesn't seem to enjoy coming home all that much. But I guess it's also set up for the next book and why things with Temnet fall apart, maybe? I don't know. I am so glad it's over. So, just some final thoughts, I suppose. For one, I would have to split this book in two things, like 
two thirds. Uh, pretty much the retelling of the Beauty and the Beast, the love story between Farah and Tamlin. The world building is atrocious. The character motivation doesn't make much sense. They don't seem to be all that intelligent either. But I guess that the first two thirds of the book are moderately okay if you just want world building as a vague backdrop and you don't think about it too much and all you want to see is the enemies to lovers romance which is already not my thing, so this book never stood a chance of going past three stars in the first place anyway, but never mind that. It had so many issues. It, yeah. But then, the really bad part is like the last third where she goes to the palace under the mountain, and it's like we're suddenly in a different story. It's like the whole retelling is pretty much out the window, and it's just Hunger Games and murder and people get even dumber in this last third. It, I didn't think that was possible, but people are so fucking dumb in this last third of the book. It's unbelievable. And then this toxic bullshit with turning this guy into love interest or, you know, even if I didn't know that he was the love interest of the second book, you can already tell that Farah actually likes him and constantly thinks of him as hot, regardless of all the things he does. Like, Ryson is possibly the worst love interest I have read in 20 years. So, this was a dumpster fire of bad world building, meh characters that make no sense and have no brains, and holes in the logic at points that you could ride them horse through that. Anyway, if I had a cat for that, I would give it zero stars, but as it is, it gets this one. At best, one star, because that's all there is. I would, like I said, the first two thirds of this book might be a little better than that, might be two star territory, but it's also not really my genre, so I can't really tell how much of that plays into it, but the last third, that was just a dumpster fire. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me throughout this whole long read-along. It was painful. I hope it was a little less painful for you. And I can now put this book in the trash. Isn't it wonderful? Yes. I will give it to somebody, but then I don't want to do the story to anybody, so, you know. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll be back next week with another video. Like and subscribe if you want to help the channel out. And thank you for your time. Bye!